Um, I do ask that you guys mute yourselves when you're not asking me a question, and definitely ask me questions if you need to, but I just want to keep the background noise down a little bit. Okay, the plan for today is we want to talk a little bit about thermostats. I want to run through a different couple different types of thermostats. We also want to talk about um, a device called a fan center. That's basically a transformer and a relay all built into one unit. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about zoning systems. Zoning systems basically comes down to it allows you to put thermostats into different areas of a building using one system. Okay, it's a little bit of and far ahead of where I really need to be today, but it is, it is in today's material. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on it. We're going to revisit zoning systems again when we get into our advanced AC. But I do want to introduce the concept. The plans for tomorrow is 100% schematics. Okay, so for tomorrow's session, we are going to be working on schematics. So for all of you who are having problems with schematics or who are just struggling a little bit on the schematics, I'm going to be spending a ton of time on schematics tomorrow. I'm going to introduce a couple new concepts as we're going through the schematics, but everything I do tomorrow is going to be based on the schematics. You will have tomorrow, you will have a couple videos that I'm going to ask you to watch here on your own, basically on code. Um, I, I don't really want to take our classroom time, which is our hour and a half conference together, to just read code. Okay, so I'd really like you guys to watch the videos on the code, and I'll make those available tomorrow. But today, let's talk about thermostats. Let's talk about um, our fan centers, and let's see if we can start getting in a place where, as I talk about schematics tomorrow, we can start pulling motors and sequence of operation together, because all of this has been prep work into where we can start talking about the air conditioning system as a whole. So again, if you have questions on schematics, I, I will be spending a ton of time on schematics tomorrow. It's basically all we're doing tomorrow. Okay. Um, on a schematic note, I put a question on several of your submissions, or a couple of you guys, not a, not a ton of you, but a couple of you guys are drawing schematics more what I would see an electrician draw. So if I put a note on your schematic asking you if you had the uh, if you have had electrical in an electrician course, let me know that please. Okay, that's sort of important for me to know um, because they draw their schematics slightly differently, and I need to help you get to the point where we're drawing and understanding ladder diagrams. They're a little bit different. So thermostats. Hey, it's one of the core components of air conditioning. Okay, it's one of our core components. Without having thermostats in a space, there's no way to control that room temperature. Okay, you, the function of a thermostat, simple. Everybody knows this, but we still have to say it, is to turn the system on and off automatically based on room temperature. Okay, thermostats don't sense humidity when we're talking about a plain thermostat. Okay, some of our digital thermostats might have humidity sensors also built into them, but a basic thermostat senses only sensible air temperature. That's temperature I can measure. Okay, thermostats need to be located on an internal wall. We want to locate them closer to return air vents because that's pulling the room air into it. Okay, it's where we get our best readings. Does anybody know why I don't ever put a thermostat on an external wall? It could be dangerous. It stays cold. Yeah, I'm going to pick up the outside air temperatures. Okay, if my wall's cold, if the insulation isn't great, or if I have drafts, I don't want that to be hitting the back of the thermostat. Okay, because it's going to it's going to either be too cold or too hot based on the wall temperature. Okay, walls are not solid, as those of you who just had design know about. Okay, Mo all of our thermostats in air conditioning that we mount on walls are 24 volts, basically due to safety and wiring, as I've talked about before. Now, if you take apart a window unit, 
okay, if you take apart a window unit or a console air conditioner like you see in a hotel room, those thermostats that are in those units might not be 24 volts. You have to check, so be careful. Our basic digital thermostat, okay, this is what the customer sees. Now we want to talk a little bit about what we see because it's two completely different things. I really could care less about what the customer's seeing when I'm diagnosing a system. One of the first things I do when I diagnose a system is I pull this faceplate off the wall, okay, because I want to see the wiring connections behind it, okay. So I want to look at the sub-base, okay. The sub-base is the component of the thermostat that holds the thermostat face on the wall. Okay, it has all the wire terminal connections, and it has locations for switches. I'm less worried right now about the must-be level, okay, other than from an appearance standpoint. Does anybody still have a mercury thermostat in your house? Yes, I do. I have one. Okay, if you have a mercury thermostat or if you're dealing with a customer that has a mercury thermostat, that's where the must-be level applies, okay, because the mercury bulb has to be mounted level. For digital thermostats, um, it's an appearance situation. From an operational standpoint, they don't need to be level, but from a customer appearance standpoint, if that thermostat is not level, um, I can guarantee you're going to get a callback on it. Okay, callbacks is an evil word in this industry. But you're going to get a call back on it because the homeowner will go nuts over a thermostat not being level. They'll see it every time they walk past it or when they look across the room. So a thermostat sub-base looks something like this, okay? We have spots for wiring connections up near the top. There's usually a spot where electrical contacts make contact with the thermostat that you're mounting above it. In the older style thermostats, we have our system switch and our fan switch, we're going to, which we'll talk more about today, okay? We have our heat, auto, cool, or off, okay? We have our auto and on fan switch. All of that is on the sub-base. We have other wiring connections here as well, and if you look closely, you can see that they're all labeled like RH, RC, okay, we have W, W, Y, and Y, okay, so all of these wiring connections are labeled, and specific purpose of all these wiring connections. Another type of sub, okay, another type of sub base, this one has everything of the thermostat sort of mounted right on it, and then you have um, the wiring connections right under here. So you take these two screws out to get or this one and this one, okay? And you have mercury bulb is right here. So again, this one matters if it's level. If it's not level, you're going to have incorrect heating and cooling. Okay, our switches are mounted on the sub-base. Okay, and again, these are non-digital thermostats. Another type, which is much more frequently seen still to this day in houses, is the round thermostats, okay? These are the little ones that are on the wall that are usually either off-white or silver in color, and they're round, and you twist them, okay? We have our wire connections right here on the sub-base. We have our switching on the sub-base. Okay, and our thermostat mounts right onto this sub-base. Okay, and again, these are important to be level because this style of sub-base, unless it's a digital round thermostat, has mercury in it. Okay, we don't see a ton of that anymore because as we've been replacing these round thermostats, we've been replacing them with digital. Anybody know why I don't want mercury in houses anymore as much as possible? Because it's harmful. Yeah. It's toxic. Okay. And there's been a lot of cases where these thermostats have gotten broken over time. And the kids play with the mercury that's on the floor and it's extremely toxic. 
So we want to get as much of this mercury out of the houses as possible. Okay. We're going to talk about this little device right here that I'm circling. <coughs> it's called an anticipator. Okay. We'll talk about that more 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 in the heating side of things, but as you, we go through our diagrams today, I'm going to show you a little bit more about that. Okay. So again, these thermostats have to be level. The digital ones really don't from a from a working standpoint, from operationally, but from a customer standpoint, I can tell you right now, you'll be back if they're not you'll be back if they're not level. The thermostat is where the temperature is sensed. The action will close a switch and turn the AC system on. The indoor blower coil, and we're going to talk about that on our schematics, is energized in AC mode. Okay, so we have two things that energize when we talk about air conditioning. We energize the outside unit, and we energize the indoor blower to move the air around the house. Okay, those two things have to come on for our air conditioning to work. Those are all controlled in air conditioning from the thermostat. Okay, the blower and the outdoor unit is controlled from the thermostat. Okay, there's two, there's basically four types of thermostats. We have the mercury bulb. We have what we call a bimetal snap, a snap action. We have a helix coil and we have solid state. Okay, the mercury bulb is this one top left. Okay, as the bimetal coil expands and contracts when it gets hot or cold, the mercury bulb will start to move up and down, and these contacts here will become made or broken based on where that mercury is. Okay, it's actually an ingenious advice for being close to 100 years old. Okay, the, the um, snap action is down here. Okay, again, there's a piece of bimetal. By what we mean bimetal, it's uh, two different types of metals that have been sandwiched together. They expand and contract at different rates. So as it heats up and cools, it actually changes shape. And as the thermostat heats and cools, this little um, action in the center here will switch positions and will snap together and close or open circuits. So again, bi the bimetal snap action is right there. Okay, our helix coil is right there. The helix coil, again, it's a bimetal coil. Again, all bimetal means is that there's two different types of metals that expand and contract at different rates that are sandwiched together. Okay, and they will, as it heats up or cools down, it's going to expand or contract and thus change the shape of the coil. Okay, so again, bimetals there. And our more recent ones where we're all going to, okay, eventually is our, digi our solid state digital. There's no moving parts in this. They're programmable. They, some people tell me they're more accurate. I sometimes di don't entirely agree on that. And a lot of them have batteries for backup power. Okay. Any questions on these four types of thermostats? Yeah, I was going to ask about the, the, the new digital ones. You said that some of them have batteries. What about, I mean, I'm sure there are ones that don't. And what, I mean, like, what happens when the power, let's just say the batteries get dead and the power goes out. What happens to the system? How do you fix that? Or does it need reset? Yeah, well, as soon as, the, as soon as the power comes back on, if you don't have a battery backup thermostat, as soon as the power comes back on, it's going to reset. Now, some of them have little batteries that are built onto it. They're rechargeable that you don't see the big batteries, but they have little batteries right on the board. Um, if that happens, it saves the program. If you have batteries that are dead and you have a power outage, okay, you're going to lose the programming, and you just have to reprogram it. Now, there is an interesting thing, and I'm, when we get to our schematics of this, I'm going to show it to you. If you have a thermostat with batteries, okay, and it's an older-style thermostat, 
if your batteries go dead, the thermostat will not operate in cooling mode. It will still operate in heating mode, but in cooling mode, if the batteries go dead in some of these thermostats, it will not operate. Um, I actually went to a I actually was on, went and did an inspection for an insurance company about three weeks ago where they had this exact style thermostat and they didn't have air conditioning. And again, where I live and people are, the elderly are obviously without air conditioning, have some problems even when we're talking March and February. So apparently the one of the homeowners had changed out the batteries and hadn't put the batteries in properly. They put two positives together instead of having your positive, negative, positive, negative the way it should have been installed. Their cooling system didn't work, okay? A contractor came out and actually diagnosed the entire system as needing to be replaced because of a power surge, okay? When in reality, the batteries were not in the thermostat correctly. So the batteries in these thermostats can make a very big difference in the operation of the system. Okay, so if you have batteries in a thermostat and if you get to a call where there's no cooling, that's why whenever, uh, you're going to hear me say this over and over again, when you get to a service call, the first place you go is the thermostat. Not sure if that answers your question on the batteries. Okay. Any other questions on any of these types of thermostats? We're going to dig into it a little bit more deeply, but this is just an overview. Okay, the terminals, we're talking about your wiring connections. They all have a specific function. If possible, try to use the correct color wire. Okay, that matches the terminal designation. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, don't count on wire colors. Okay, all of your thermostats are like a, has a Y terminal. Okay, should be a yellow wire on there, but there's a lot of thermostats now that are connected with CAT5 wire. Try to find a plain yellow wire in CAT5 cabling. That's computer network cable. Okay, you're not going to find wire sometimes with the correct color. So just be very aware if it doesn't have the correct color wire, you have to figure out what color wire they used and be able to look at the thermostat side and the equipment side and make sure the wire color matches. Okay, thermostats should be connected with rated thermostat wire. Again, there's specific thermostat wire out there on the market that you can buy from Home Cheapo and any of the other home improvement stores out there. Okay, but I, again, it's sometimes cheaper to buy it from your supply house. Okay, thermostat wire always starts with the le numbers 18 for 18 gauge wire. And then it's going to have a slash and it's going to have another number like 6, 2, don't ever use 2 anymore, 4, and it can go up to 12. Okay. So what this designation is saying is you have 18 gauge wire and you have six wires inside the thermostat cable. Okay, so you have six different wires inside this whole, the whole wiring assembly. 18.2 says you have 18 gauge wire, you have two wires. 18.4 says you have 18 gauge cable and four wires. 18.12 Okay, you have 18 K gauge wire and you have 12 conductors in that thermostat cable. When you're you when 18 you're 18 gauge is standard. 18 gauge is standard for thermostat. Okay, now when you start talking commercial buildings, you may start seeing 22 gauge. Okay, so. 18 gauge is the standard for thermostat wiring, but do not be surprised if you see 22 gauge. When you're stripping thermostat wire back, when you're stripping the ends, getting rid of the insulation, 
don't strip too far back, okay? Just strip the amount of insulation off the wire that you need to get under the screws. It's very easy to have a short circuit at the thermostat. You put the, you are wired to the sub base of the thermostat, you put the thermostat front on, okay, and all of a sudden you have way too much wire exposed. Okay, so don't strip and expose too much copper. The terminals, and again, if you've not downloaded this handout, I strongly suggest you do it. I left the instructor PowerPoints available for you guys to download so you have the full screen version. Okay, if these terminals, you have to know what they are. Okay, let me repeat. These terminal designations, you have to know what they are. When you're sitting down with a potential boss in the future, when you're doing job interviews, I'm going to tell you right now, thermostat designations are the letters and where they go and what they do is a favorite interview question. Okay? Someone's going to interview you eventually and just out of the blue, they're going to say, what does the G terminal on the thermostat do? It's the fan relay. Okay, so we have terminal designations. RC is 24 volts from the transformer, from the cooling transformer, in case you have a different transformer from heating. Most of the time now they're the same. Y is our cooling contactor. That controls our outdoor unit. Some systems, the more efficient you get, Y2 is second stage cooling. Okay, it's going to have a blue core. It's going might have a blue wire under it. Might have another type of wire. G is the fan relay coil. Okay, this is a favorite question, and I can almost guarantee it's going to be on your final exam as well. G is the fan relay coil. It's green most often. Now, what else is a green wire? What else in electrical is a green wire? Anybody, especially my um, returning students who are not in their first year, what, what was that? It's the ground. The hard ground. Yeah, a lot of times ground is a green wire. You don't know how many times I ask the question, what is the G terminal on the thermostat, and someone tells me ground. It is not. The G terminal on a thermostat is for the fan. Okay, thermostats are not grounded. It's low voltage. We don't ground that. Okay, so fan relay coil is the G terminal on the thermostat. You gotta you gotta remember that it's important. O is what we go to a reversing valve. Okay, when we're talking a heat pump system, O is a reversing valve. We'll talk more about that in the future. RH, if you have a different system for your heating side, RH is 24 volts from the heating transformer. W is a heat relay. It turns on the heat. W2 is a second stage heat relay. C is common, and most often it's wired with a black wire. There's two ter actually there's three terminals you never want to have connected together. You don't want them touching. You don't want the wires close to it. It's very important. RC, RH, and C. These terminals can never be wired together. If you wire any of the Rs together and have it touching the C. Okay? Either one of these R's touching the C, you're going to short out your transformer. Okay, because when we have our transformer on our low voltage side, okay, you have your transformer coil. Okay, my R is on one side, and my C stands for common, and it is on the other side. You never want to take R to C without there being a load together in the middle. Any questions on that? Okay, so when you're drawing your diagrams, 
Before you turn in diagrams, when you draw your ladder schematics using a low voltage side, just do a double check and make sure that there's absolutely no rung of your ladder that comes across from R to C without having a load in the center. Just, just eyeball it before you submit it because that's a direct short circuit and you're going to burn out the transformer. Any questions on these designations, on these terminals? The beauty of these whole things is that they're actually dead, that the letters are always on everything on both sides. So it's on your thermostat, it's on your equipment side as well, and outside when you go to the outdoor unit, the wire colors sort of make sense. So it's, it's pretty easy to follow. Okay, this page is another one of these pages that I would probably recommend saving. Okay, the top, the top left thermostat here, where I'm putting, I'm basically saying it's number one. Okay, this is my basic cooling thermostat. Okay, it has an R, Y, and a G. Okay, R is my feed from my transformer. Y goes to my outside unit. And G goes to my fan relay. That is my basic cooling thermostat. Now, is this a pictorial diagram or is this a ladder schematic that I'm looking at? Ladder huh? schematic? This is a pictorial. Okay, ladder schematics is what I've been showing you guys how to draw. Okay, the difference between the two is that this one shows you how to wire it. Okay, a pictorial will always show you how to wire it. A ladder schematic shows you the sequence of operation. That's the difference between the two. Okay, thermostat number two. Okay, which is my one right here. Thermostat number two. What have we added? We have W. I've added my W, right? So now this thermostat can do heating as well as cooling. Okay, as long as there's one transformer. So this would be something you might see on a gas furnace. Okay, single transformer does both heating and cooling. What about number three? What have we added? I have an extra oh, R terminal, don't I? RF and RC. I've added, I now have an RC and an RH. All this says is I can use two separate transformers. Okay, RC is on my cooling system. RH is on my heating system. This setup has been used in oil systems. Okay, so this setup is very specifically for oil. Okay, because your oil system has its own transformer right built as a part of the primary control. Okay, you have an RC, which is for your cooling side. Okay, number four. What have we added? H2, W2, H1, Y1. This is a heat pump thermostat. As soon as you see the designation B, as in boy, or O, okay, this is a heat pump. You said it would be B or O? B or O. Like this one over on, if you look all the way over on the right and see my number six. Yeah, I've seen O as the reversing valve. I just never saw it as B before. Yeah, B is the old style. They don't see it anymore. Okay, I don't want to get ahead of myself on here, but B is, was more heavily used in the southern climates where cooling was the default, and we energized the reversing valve for heat. Okay, O is more standard now. 
and O basically says when the system starts, it's in heating mode, and I energize the reversing valve for cooling. Okay, and again, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself because I haven't even really talked about what a heat pump does yet. Okay, so, so four and six are essentially the same, just one's older style? Yeah, four and six are essentially the same thermostat, but we just energize the reversing valve on number four in heating mode, and in number um, six, we energize it in, re in cooling mode. And you can see where that wire coming out of the terminal goes to. In number four, that wire goes up and it's energized when my mode is in heating, if you look at this down here through, okay? In number six, you follow that terminal down and it's energized when my mode is in cooling. So six would be more of a northern thing. Well, now it's becoming more standard, okay? I mean, I'm in the south, and my heat pump is set up to have an O terminal. But it used to be that you would see four down in the, down in the southern climates more because cooling is our default, and six you would see in the northern climates. But now O's become more of the standard. Make sense? Yep. Okay. What about the one I skipped? What about number five? What have we done here? Secondary heating and cooling. Well, second stage. Okay. So this is actually a very efficient system. So let's say you have a cool, not cold, fall day. Or a warm, but not really, really hot spring day. Okay, we energize first stage of either heating or cooling. Okay, in other words, we're not using the full power of the system. If it's heating, we may energize the furnace at a lower flame. If it's cooling, we may use only partial capacity of the compressor. All of a sudden, the, warmer, the weather gets warmer, has a much higher temperature in the peak summer months. The system can't keep up with the cooling just on stage one, so a couple degrees warmer, we have set stage two of the thermostat. Okay, so maybe we have stage one set to come on at 72 degrees, and at 75 degrees, we want to have stage two come in because the system's not, not maintaining. So we close, the ten, we close the second terminal on the thermostat, and we say, okay, we need the full power of the system, and we're going to bring on the second stage. Now, this is not part of every system that's out there. This is a very high-end system, okay? So specifically, the system has to be designed and manufactured to have this capability. But, a lot, but on higher-end homes, and this is very frequent in commercial environments, you will have a stage one and a stage two of both heating and cooling. In commercial environments, stage one, a lot of times, is we just bring in outside air. And stage so two... So what is that one called? What was that? What is that thermostat called? It's just a two-stage heat, two-stage cool. Again, the, the number five is two-stage heat, two-stage cool thermostat. Now, what terminal are all of these thermostats missing that might be important for a digital thermostat? There's one terminal missing on every one of these thermostats. Common. Common. On all of these thermostats, you do not have a C. So on every single one of these thermostat sub-bases, if you see this, your thermostat either is not digital or... It has batteries, okay? It does not have the common from the transformer on this thermostat, on any of these thermostats. So on all of these, if it's a digital thermostat, okay, you would have a C terminal as well, as long as, and this is where you start getting into a problem if you don't have enough wires in your thermostat. Okay, so if a homeowner has one of these old thermostats, let's say they have number two mounted on their wall, okay, and it's a little round thermostat, has mercury in it, 
and it's an older style thermostat and they want to install a programmable thermostat without batteries okay you might not be able to do it if you don't have a spare thermostat wire so when you're running new thermostat wire you always want to run it you always want to go one conductor higher than you need so there's a spare wire there in case anybody ever needs to change anything in the future it's always nice to have a spare wire you can always pull new thermostat wire but sometimes that's very very difficult to do and you can go wireless but that becomes much more expensive because you've got to install a wireless um, wireless receiver and transmitter on the system itself so that becomes more expensive as time goes on so again these thermostats that I have the diagrams here this is for non-digital or for digital with a battery okay and again batteries die in thermostats and if you don't change the battery when that low battery indicator comes on your thermostat is going to lose its programming and eventually will not work in cooling mode most often for some reason they continue to work in heating mode as long as possible but it's the cooling mode that doesn't work okay so again our snap action this is what the one I was showing you on that on that other screen this little piece in the middle opens and closes based on the temperature and it snaps down and it makes a good solid connection against the against this bar right here the red one at the bottom makes a good solid connection there that snap action older style non-digital and you can actually hear it another snap action is this one right here as this helix begins to expand or contract based on the bimetal element that's in here again bimetal two dissimilar metals put together they expand and contract at different rates okay it's going to snap together this one has a magnet in it to ensure that when this snaps together there's no bouncing it's going to snap together and it's going to make a good solid connection because of that magnet okay and again, you can hear these open and close if you have them in a house. It's That's a little that similar point. to what's in a car. What was that? I said that's similar to what's in a car, thermostat-wise. Oh. oh, okay. Yeah, I, uh, I'm not familiar with that side of things. I know a car, what I know about cars, I turn the key and I expect it to run. <laughs> but um, I, I definitely take your word for it. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's how, like, a regular car's thermostat for the engine works. You had to buy a metal coil like that. Okay, what about the magnet? Is that in there as well? I believe it is. Okay. So, again, makes a good, solid contact. Why don't I want these points to bounce around? Anytime I have an electronic, an electrical connection being made... I have a chance of a little tiny spark a little tiny spark will actually eventually start to build up carbon on the points okay even low voltage I'll build up carbon on the points the other reason is is these connections are connected to something okay so if I have this going this says heat but if I have this going outside to my cooling contactor in the outdoor unit if I push this together and it right away bounces a little bit that contactor outside is going to bounce on and off and that's not good for the compressors we're going to talk more about that when we talk about compressors but I want a good solid contact it basically has to make up its mind is it open or closed I don't want to have bouncing connections okay again the mercury ones they're starting to go out but they're still important they're still out here on the market okay and they even give you a spot on all of these across the top there's one right there and one right there you can stick a level across it to make sure they're level the biggest issue that I see when people install these old style thermostats and I hope they're not installing them anymore but I've seen is they're not level if they're not level you're not going to maintain proper temperature okay very important and again the mercury goes back and forth it's connected to thin wires that go through the glass housing 
and based on where the mercury is, it's either heat on or cool on or nothing at all. Could a customer request the older style of uh, thermostat? You know, a good company, the customer can request but a good company, for environmental reasons, is not going to even install it. I mean, if a customer requested me, I'd be so freaking polite, but I'd basically talk them into, I'd talk them into a simple snap action, okay? They'll never really understand the difference, but when a customer, what, well, let me put it this way. What customer would be most likely to, uh, request the old style thermostat. What's somebody your that, uh, I don't know. Somebody that's older and doesn't like change and thinks well enough is well enough. I'm going to say a, a, real, a real estate company too. Okay, um, let's address both of those differently, but it comes down to the same thing. If I can give both of those customers an older style thermostat without the fancy digital controls at a decent price. Okay, does it matter to that customer really whether or not it's mercury or snap action? Yeah, they're more concerned about the price. Or the ability to operate it. Okay. Yeah, the user friendly features. Yeah, the older cust the older customers for the most part really don't want those digital controls. They're never gonna program it. They want to be able to slide the lever and just have the thermostat. The real estate company, on the other hand, is very price conscious. Okay, but the real estate company has to also be concerned about environmental hazards. So for the real estate company, my answer is, I'm sorry because of environmental reasons, we do not install the mercury thermostats anymore. However, I have the snap action that has the same functionality, probably a little bit of a lower price and it will do what you need it to do when it's not a top of the line, very expensive thermostat. For the older demographic, I would again say, here, and I'd actually hand it to them, and I'd say, this is what I can give you. See, it still has the basic on off functionality, no digital, but it also is safer to have in your house because it doesn't have any mercury. That's where I'd go with that. Make sense? You just sold me if I was an old person. <laughs> like how you worded that. <sighs> okay. Um, yeah, I had a I had a technician who worked for me for a while when I was in the field as a service manager who um, sold, we called it the enterprise thermostat at the time. Okay, now this was a number of years ago when the heavy digital thermostats were just first coming out. They were being programmed and stuff like that. He sold a 75-year-old woman who lived alone. Uh, her, her grandkids and kids were, like, living across the country, and she just refused to move out of her family's home and go join her kids, and she needed a new thermostat. Well, the technician got a – we used to give a commission at that time for upgrading the thermostats to the newer programmable ones. And he got a commission of it. He, like, got a 50-buck commission or something like that. Well, for the six years following, we sent him out to that house twice a year on his own time to reprogram that thermostat because she could never program that thermostat for summer and winter on her own. So he just had it in his calendar that every spring or fall, he'd just swing by the house on his way to or from work and fix her thermostat for her. Um, so, again, we have to be careful about what we sell to customers, what we do for customers, because sometimes they just can't operate the new stuff. Okay, Nest thermostats. Um, everybody know what a Nest thermostat is? No. no. The Nest thermostats are one of the Wi-Fi thermostats. Okay, it's now owned by Google. Okay, and it has a Nest, it has an interface on your phone that you can actually change the programming of the thermostat by either going to the wall or going onto your wireless, onto your cell phone. Okay, we've had a rash of these being installed in, um, quite honestly, again, my older demographics and a demographic that doesn't have internet at home. Okay, 
So why would you even think about installing a Nest thermostat in somebody's house that doesn't have internet? It doesn't make sense to me, but people are doing it. My Honeywell that I ha- that I installed on my wall um, has a Wi-Fi option, but it can run without being programmed. Like why why doesn't Nest why did they design it to only run off a of Wi-Fi? Why can't they design it better like this one? Because this one runs. On my phone, I can be upstairs and I can change the temperature or turn it off. I can be at school and turn it off. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I like the Honeywells. They make two models that are Wi-Fi or Z-Wave, and both of them are decent. Okay, the reason I think Nest has done it is they're really into the Internet of Things. You have to remember Nest has the cameras. Nest has everything that are all these Internet-enabled devices. Um, They really... You know, it will run without Wi-Fi, but to program it properly and to really get it to work properly with programming, it needs to have the Wi-Fi. Wow. Um, So, I mean, I can use it to control temperature, but people aren't going to be happy with it because the whole reason they bought the Nest thermostat is that they can program, they can use it from remotely. So, it's, it's really... Nest is very connected, so you really never want to install a Nest thermostat if there's no connectivity. And I agree, it's, it's, it's a problem. But again, just be careful what you sell customers, because they're not going to be happy. This is the Helix coil. Does anybody know what these resistors are? These are resistors that are mounted in the thermostats. Anybody from a previous who has been through thermostats previously, have you ever been talked about these resistors? Okay, I assume the answer is no. So the resistors are what we call anticipators. Okay, we're specifically in this class going to talk about cooling anticipators. What an anticipator does, it turns on the thermostat. It closes the connection between R and Y slightly before the temperature reaches the set point. Okay, so rather than have the house get to 75 degrees and the cooling system have to keep up, it's going to close the thermostat slightly before. So it might close that thermostat when the temperature gets to 74 and a half degrees. So what it's doing, it's sort of faking out the thermostat and saying, okay, the room temperature is actually half a degree warmer than it actually is. The way this all works, okay, is we have a cooling relay, okay, that's in here. Okay, this is my cooling relay. Okay, so this is my Y wire. This is my R over here. Okay, this that I'm circling is the inside of my thermostat. Okay, so that resistor, okay, that you saw there on the last slide, this resistor is positioned so that if these resistors heat up a little bit, they warm up, they actually provide a little bit of heat to this coil. And it will actually heat up that coil a little tiny bit. It's not a ton of heat. But it will heat that coil a little bit when the thermostat is shut off. Okay? It's a bypass. Everybody understand now why I wanted us to talk about bypass? This cooling anticipator resistor is right there. When my thermostat is not calling for cooling, it's going to heat up. That resistor, again, not red hot, but it's going to provide a slight amount of heat to the thermostat. So it's going to be, the thermostat is going to think that the room is slightly warmer than it actually is. What this does is it will actually close this, it will close the thermostat, okay, a little bit early. It anticipates the need for cooling. When the thermostat is closed, this resistor is no longer getting power because the current goes on the path of least resistance. Okay. So is it called so a bypass resistor? resistor? It's called an anticipator is the official name, a cooling anticipator. 
Okay, and if you look at this first circuit, let me erase my scribble so you can see the first circuit. If you look at the first circuit, when the thermostat is not calling for cooling, where's my power going? I have two loads in series, right? Okay, first diagram here. I have two loads in series when my thermostat is not calling. This resistor is at a resistance where it's going to take all of the power. The coil is just being used as a path back to neutral. Remember I told you there's only a couple occasions in the HVAC industry where we have loads in series. This is one of them, the cooling anticipator. When the thermostat is not calling, this cooling anticipator is actually in series with the coil. Now, when the thermostat closes, this cooling anticipator is no longer the path of least resistance. It comes out of the circuit. It's still connected, but all the current is going to flow through the switch because it has a much lower resistance, and then it's going to get to the coil. Okay, this coil, most of them are around 14 to 18 ohms. Very low resistance. Okay, so any time I have an anticipator, this resistance of this anticipator is always over the resistance of my outdoor coil. So the voltage drop on this is going to be greater on the resistor than the outdoor coil. The outdoor coil will never get enough voltage to actually operate. Questions? I know somebody has one. Okay, so if I ever ask you in the future, in air conditioning, where do you see two loads in series? Can you answer the question? In air conditioning, where do you see two loads in series? With a cooling anticipator. With the cooling anticipator, when the thermostat is not calling for cooling. Also, with like a P what was that? Like a PTC start relay would also be a good example of that. Yeah, let, that's that's another one. We're going to talk more about that when we start talking about motors. But it this is where we really really see the two loads in series on the control voltage. And you're right. I'm not discounting your answer on PTC start relays. I just don't want to go there yet. <laughs> Hello. Okay, now this one down here, I'm not going to worry that much. Um, this is just a bigger picture of this, okay? Again, it's a fixed resistor. Now, the difference between the cooling relays and the heating relays, I'm not going to go into the heating side, but for those of you who've already had heating, there's a big difference between the cooling anticipator and the heating anticipator. Does anybody know what it is? No. I know. Go ahead. Does anybody know who's had heating? Specifically probably gas. Okay. Has, does anybody know what the difference between the cooling and the heating anticipator is? Okay, the heating anticipator is adjustable. The cooling anticipator is fixed. It's a fixed resistance. Okay, the, the heating anticipator is adjustable. That's your difference. Somewhere, someplace, you're going to be asked about it. Okay, I'm not exactly sure. I think I saw it on a licensing exam in Connecticut. The cooling anticipator is a fixed resistor. It's not adjustable. Heating resistors, heating anticipators are adjustable. Okay, in a window unit, the thermostat is usually has a remote bulb. We have a thermostat that's adjustable up here in the unit itself by the controls. We have a remote bulb that goes in front of the in front of the forced air. Okay, digital thermostats basically are more sensitive and more accurate. 
We're going to talk much more about time delays. They have a time delay built into them. And they have a battery backup to store temperature settings. Okay. Um, again, power failures are a problem if you don't have a battery backup or if the thermostat doesn't have an internal rechargeable battery on it. Most of them do these days. You've got to have a C wire. You have to have a common if you don't have a battery backup. Okay. Honeywell, again, has different types of thermostats. I think Honeywell thermostats are probably one of the best thermostats out there. Um, the problem for contractors, why they don't install a ton of Honeywell thermostats is because now Home Depot carries them and we can't do our markups properly. Okay, because it's very embarrassing to go to a customer and say, yeah, I charged you 60 bucks for that thermostat that I can, that you were able to buy from Home Depot at 25 bucks. So a lot of us don't install Honeywell thermostats anymore. We pick another brand because of the fact that they're available in Home Depot. Um, White Rogers is one we install frequently or some of the other brands that are only available through the supply houses because we can do our markups better. Okay, thermostat sensing element in a digital thermostat is a thermistor. It's just a device that changes its resistance based on um, the temperature. Okay, programmable. Um, makes system completely automatic. I don't want to spend a ton of time on these because basically this is the default standard right now. Okay, if you look in a programmable thermostat, if you look on the inside of the cover, okay, it has a lot of times a code or how you get into the installer setup of the thermostat. Saves money is questionable. There's more and more studies coming out that programmable thermostats, if they're programmed incorrectly and your temperature swings are too large, it can actually cost you money. So I would never advertise to a customer. I never tell a customer anymore, You're, this thermostat will save you money because you cannot guarantee how they're going to program it. Okay. Normally has four functions, wake, leave, return, and sleep. Okay. They can be programmed for seven days or five days, or sometimes you can now more and more, you can program for different days of the month and you can change it. Okay. So, this is the original programming, but more and more, it's, it, you can change. You have much more settings on these, especially when you start getting into the connected thermostats, like the Nest, the Honeywells that are Wi-Fi capable or Z-Wave. Okay. They're all basically the same. They could have five day, two day, seven day, seven days each with a different programming. They can be switched to a manual or override. Okay, override that allows you to handle, like if you're home for a day or two and don't want it to go to its programming. Okay, the one thing I want you to remember on digital thermostats is there's a five to eight minute time delay built into these things for the outdoor unit, for the compressor, for the condenser. Okay, five to eight minutes. So if you're in there servicing the equipment and you turn the thermostat power off, and you service the equipment and turn it back on to test it, you get to wait between five and eight minutes for that thermostat to say, okay, we can start air conditioning, okay, because there's a five to eight minute time delay. This is very frustrating, and there's really a lot of times no way to bypass it. So any questions on thermostats? Okay, any questions on anything I've gone over today so far? Okay, there's one more thing I want to touch on, and we're going to come back to this tomorrow because I don't have a ton of time left with you guys this morning. Um, I do want to sort of talk about fan centers, but again, I'm not going to finish this today. We're going to come back to it tomorrow because we're going to talk about it with our schematics. Okay, a fan center is something we add to a gas furnace or an oil heat system to allow us to install air conditioning. Now again, more and more you won't have to do this because the equipment comes with the appropriate um, 
setup to run air conditioning. But the older style oil equipment, the older style gas equipment was just set up to be a heating only system. The whole reason it's called a fan center is because our fan, our blower motors, are multi-speed. Okay, we have to be able to turn it on to high speed for cooling and low speed for heating. Okay, we really don't have, we have to be able to hit those two different speeds. A fan center has two parts in it. We've already talked about these two parts. That's why I'm really not all that worried about it. You have a transformer, which has a 120 volt to 24 volt. And you have a fan relay. It's a Mars relay mounted in the box. Okay? And all it comes is pre-wired. So you have nice little connections where you can put your R wire, your C wire, your Y, your W, and your G. Okay? So the fan center is a Mars relay and a transformer. Looks like that. That's our fan center. There's really nothing magical about it. Okay, you have your little wiring connections down there. Okay, our relay energizes on a connection to G. And we have everything in one place. Okay, we've already talked about this circuit a number of times. Okay, we're going to start talking about this circuit on schematics tomorrow. Because we're going to start it wiring. I'm going to start showing you how air conditioning systems are actually wired on our schematics. The terminals on them are terminal. It's my 24 volts from the transformer. The C terminal, it's the common from the transformer. And it's pre-wired to the side, to one side of the relay. Comes pre-wired. Don't have to wire anything. The W terminal, it's just a connection. It doesn't do anything other than allow you to connect two wires together. The same thing with the Y terminal. Again, just allows you to connect two wires together. And the G terminal comes from the thermostat G terminal and you connect it together. So you take the G on the thermostat and you connect it to the G on the fan center. Hard to mess up. Okay, and the G energizes that relay. This is probably one of the most important um, one of the most important diagrams of fan centers that I can give you. Okay, this is a pictorial again. This is not a ladder diagram. This is a pictorial. It shows you how to wire. We take our line voltage in there. We take our neutral into white. Okay. We take our thermostat G to there. We take our thermostat R to there. W to the thermostat. Y to the thermostat. Y also connects to my outdoor unit. C connects to my outdoor unit. Okay? That's how easy this is. My blower motor, I bring line in here. Okay? Red goes to my um, high speed. Brown goes to my low speed or whatever's controlling my heat side. Could be a um, fan limit switch or something. Controlling my heat side. Okay, these are really easy to wire. Okay, just because it has a ton of terminals on it, don't let it concern you. Because again, they're easy to wire. You just connect the terminals together. That's why they're designed to be so easy to wire. And we're gonna look at this in a schematic tomorrow. Okay, this just breaks it down a little bit more. Again, my thermostat here connects to the appropriate wires down on my terminals. Okay, I wouldn't connect a wire in the middle like I've done here. I'd bring both wires to my W terminal or my Y terminal. Okay, uh, one um, yeah, I, I printed out the slideshow for today so I could make notes and I don't have, I don't have these slides. Did you print the handout? Yeah, the, the, the air conditioning thermostat handout, but this isn't this isn't in here. Okay, so someone didn't update the handout. Let me re-update that handout, or go ahead and grab the. Do you have access to PowerPoint? 
for office. Yeah. Things. Yeah, grab the instructor set. Okay. Okay, I'll update the PDF one later today, but update, grab the instructor set. Yeah, because the last page I have is the one with the helix coil diagram. Well, it's the picture of the helix, diagram, uh, the helix coil. Oh, wait a sec. I changed PowerPoints. Did you see that I did this? This is the fan center PowerPoint. Uh, I did not notice that. Yeah, I changed PowerPoints. This is the fan center. All right. I'll find that. Sorry about that. Okay, guys, we are through our time for today. Does anybody have any questions for me? And we will start with fan centers tomorrow as we're doing our schematics. As I said, tomorrow is all about schematics. Okay. Any questions? Uh, Chris Anthony, um, I, I did today's 